So yeah, welcome uh, to our podcast, The Delicious Legacy. Thanks. Um, and yeah, today we have with us Ned Palmer, the author of um, Cheesemonger's History of the British Isles. And we're going to talk about ancient cheese. <laughs> and we mean, you know, cheese of antiquity, not some really old bit of cheese. Like We're not going to talk about, you know, a 50-year-old bit of cheddar that someone left down the back of a sofa. No. Okay. We're not, just, yeah. just set in the record really, straight. Yeah, we try and... Uh, find the origins of cheese yeah. as much as we can yeah so f- first um, i want to ask you a little bit about um, yourself so how did you fell into the vat of curds uh, <laughs> <laughs> there's like obelix isn't it you know yeah. falling into yeah. the magic yeah. potion that is what i did fall into a magic potion because my life since cheese has been magic Excellent. And, but the way that it started was literally that i ate a piece of cheese it was borough market it was winter 2000 I was back from Australia and learning that you can't make any money out of theatre. And my mate Todd said, come and sell my cheese at Borough Market. And he makes uh, a traditional kefili, it's a Welsh style cheese. And he used to make it in his little village, Llandewi Brevi, mm-hmm. in West Wales. Yeah. That's where he made it when, when, when I tried it. So I went down there. I'd never done anything like this before, retail, food, anything. And I tried some cheese and I felt angry. Because I realised that all the cheese I'd ever had in my life was rubbish. Yeah. And I was quite cross. And also I was obsessed because it was so fascinating. This flavour was so fascinating. It was so complex. How does this product, something simple made from milk, mm-hmm. have that depth and complexity? He would bring the cheese down from the farm every week. Yeah. And each batch would look different and taste a bit different. But it's the same recipe. And it was like magic. And I was asking, you know, asking him lots of questions. And eventually he said, I'll get you a job at Neil's Yard Dairy if you stop bothering me. So I went there and I was really lucky because they still stored all the soft cheese in the cellar in Covent Garden. And I worked with an amazing guy called Bill Oglethorpe, who's like the Yoda to my Luke Skywalker mm-hmm. of cheese, you know? And he's, he's super wise. He's a Zambian um, cheese maker now. So he makes cheese in a railway arch in Bermondsey. Swiss cheese in a railway arch in Bermondsey. He's a magic guy. <laughs> so he taught me how to look after cheese. Yeah. Because we got them young and we grew the rinds like we can see on the goat's cheese. We grew them on there and, and, and looked after them. And it was, you know, it's like a calling. And I didn't even know that was a thing. Yeah. And the first true. day that I, was, I went to the cellar, I just, it, I looked at the rotor and it said cheese. And I'm, I'm a bit of a dick. So I went to the boss and said, you know, this is a cheese shop, right? And she went, go down to the cellar. <laughs> And I went down and there's Bill and there's these things and, you know, you have to turn them and pack them and rub them. Yeah. And you don't get a formal training. It's not like there's a book of, it's called affinage mm. to, to do this because the British don't have a, we're not civilised enough to have a word for, for this yet. So the, the person who does it is called an affineur. You know, we have to borrow this French word. And there's no book. So Bill would teach you, but he's quite, what's the word, gnomic. He's like the Delphic Oracle. Yeah. You know, he doesn't say much, and then he's, he's quite elusive. Um, he's very like a jazz musician in a way to yeah. me. So a lot of the time I learnt by touching the cheese, thinking yeah. this is quite wet. So I'll move it away from the humidifier to mm. dry it a bit, or it's just, this is really, it's getting really soft, it's too hot, I'll, I'll cool it down. And we had no temperature control. Mm-hmm. So to make it hotter, you put it higher up in the attic, and to make it lower, you put it lower down. And just to make the connection to ancient cheese making, in Columella, I think it is, um, on, on nature, yeah. it's basically an agricultural treatise, he talks about affinage and he says in the first stage, the cheeses must be put on a rack in, in the wind, you know, and separate enough from each other so that they don't huddle together and get too moist. And that's exactly what we did. And when I read it, it was like the hair stood up on my neck because there's a 2,000-year-old instruction from for affinage which i wish i'd you know someone had told me about yeah but there's the guy doing exactly what i learned to do so it's just when you're doing it it's magical you know that you're connected with a past that yeah, yeah the, the methods haven't changed brilliant yeah that's that's kind of uh, one thing that was in my mind forever mm. you know how much you can say that things are connected yeah with all the cheese, con- cheese history yeah and well should we try some cheese Of course, okay, yes. So I'm going to just be rude and start with one of the ones I brought. Uh, that's not um, rude at all. Good. Yeah. And it's um, because it, it really... So this is a simple, fresh goat's cheese called Peroche. Yeah. And it's made in Herefordshire by right. a guy called Charlie Westhead, who's a lovely man. 
mm-hmm. and the tech this this for me is the ur cheese it's the first cheese that appeared the first evidence we find is in the fertile crescent in northern turkey what's now northern turkey yeah in around 7000 bc and the only evidence is traces of milk fat on shards of pottery that's all we've got and some broken up bits of strainer so they were draining curd mm. so i think with the simplest technology and just taking milk and letting it sour which it would in the warm yeah temperature with the culture that was living in the in the bowls and in the milk um even possibly some rennet if you made it in mm. a very traditional way with a goat's stomach um i think you'd make this goats are the first dairying animals to be domesticated i believe so i think our first cheese was a goat's cheese and i think it's a simple fresh cheese and Great. if the cheese maker from 7000 bc you know came over to to Herefordshire and visited Charlie in his dairy. Um, they would, I think, they would see what they what he was doing. They recognise it. So even though the, now the equipment's made of stainless steel and plastic, it's the same stuff and the same process. Yeah. So I think it's an absolute continuity. Oh wow! And it's beautiful, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's it's just beautiful. Yeah, it's mm. it's very fresh, obviously, as you said. But yeah. you can feel, you can taste almost. The aromas of the grass and the flowers. So true, yeah. And the herbs, and the yeah. cheese itself. Yeah. That is a lovely. The sense of terroir that the um, the, mm. the, the flavour comes from the land, which again a word we have to borrow from the French, great word, um, and the flavour of the grass and the herbs from that place may come through in the milk. This is such a simple fresh cheese that. There's only the merest hint of that. I love the texture too. Yeah. And this is skillful cheese making. You know, you cannot, you have to be so gentle right. with the curd and so patient with the curd to, to have this beautiful soft texture. Mm. If you were stirring it really fast, you'd hurry or heated it too fast, you would lose a lot of that yeah. beautiful texture. It's like a mousse. It is. It's so, almost like a mousse, yeah. I mean, they try it with a lovely wine. I actually often pair very fresh acidic goat's cheese like this with a red. It's one of the few mm. cheeses I do pair with the red. Great. Because I think they contrast each other and the cheese brings out the fruits. I think a beer and white wine, I think it probably works a lot better generally with, with cheeses. I do tend to think that. In fact, <laughs> I know this is divisive, but I really mm. think that beer is the most versatile partner for cheese and has so many flavours that are present in beer and present in cheese that you don't find in wine. Mm. Some of the caramelised nutty yes. flavours you get from the malts, I guess, yeah. and some of the fruity odd esters from the yeasts, and then um, a lot of the aromatics in the hops. Yeah. Uh, and I think there's such a range of flavour and texture in beer that I feel that it should be... It's kind of got this low rent, um, mm. you know image to it although that's changed hugely since the craft beer thing yeah it does change but uh, yeah I think people don't people think fine wines mm. you know and or even you know pretty good wines and then the beers have been more kind of down down market yeah and also i don't know about in greece but in england i think there is a very strong perception that you have red wine and cheese mm. yeah. i'm not sure where it comes from but i do have two theories and, but the main thing, I think, is if there are... I think there are now 2,000 distinct varieties of cheese in the world. So that's 2,000 sets of flavours and textures, a unique yeah. match, all of those. They cannot all go with one kind of wine. It's mad. True. And um, also, I think the tannin in some of the bigger reds is a, has a very strange effect on soft, creamy textures mm. like um, some of the softer cheeses we've got. So I don't know where it comes from. I think one thing is, in the Middle Ages, just to stick with the whole history... Yeah. We drank an awful lot of claret from Bordeaux, so much. I think we might have managed to kind of drink more per head of, of volume of wine than we do now. I may, might be exaggerating. It was a lot. And I just think if you said to a, times. an English <laughs> pie, I know, right? It was, it, I don't know how good it was because they couldn't age it. Yeah. They didn't, couldn't age in the bottle. Mm. So it was, I think it was, it was pretty young, pretty sharp, I imagine. Yeah, yeah. But, um... Nice for cheese, actually, I think. But so being, I think, being I think, that more yeah. delicate, you know. Yeah, yeah, what, maybe that's younger. why. Yeah. yeah, maybe that's why. Mm. Also, I just think if you said to a medieval English person, you know, wine, they just think of claret. Mm. Then the, I think the other thing is if people start their meal with the white, they're going to move on to the heavier wines and the reds by the end of the yeah. evening. So that's when they have their cheese, is at the end. Yes. 
So is it that they've moved on to the red yeah. at that point? And I would just then open another bottle. I'd be fine. I'd just like open the white. And that would be cool. <gasps> Great. Um, so I want to ask you, obviously, from your research mm. into cheese and all your experience, how did, uh, what are the prevalent theories of how did we first make cheese and... Yeah, so... Why humanity? <laughs> there's a, it's, it's a wonderful story. For me, the discovery of cheese making is an image of human ingenuity. Mm. Also of human inquisitiveness and hunger, but of ingenuity in a sense that I just, I love it about humans. And it's our biggest downfall. You know, we invent cheese and we invent cars. Yeah. You know, and it's all part of the same sort of, I want to go fast. I want to, I want to eat that stuff and milk me. You know. So what I... So in 7000 BC, all adult humans were lactose intolerant. They could not digest right. milk. Once you were weaned off the breast, you stopped, you lot began to lose the ability to digest milk. Mm. When you make milk into cheese, you make it digestible for lactose intolerant people. So you heard it here first. Every lactose intolerant person can eat cheese. Right. If cheese is making you sick, it isn't the lactose intolerant, it's something else. Right, okay. So this is a bit of a scoop. So there's something else there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it could be an allergy to certain mm. proteins in the milk. It could be, I mean, modern milk from factory production is from really intensively bred freezing and Holstein cows is right. unnerves me. <laughs> um, but so I think you had these herders and they're raising goats. There's all this milk. They're hungry people. Peasants are hungry. They wanted to eat it. And every time they eat, ate it or drank the milk, it made them really sick. Um, somebody happened to notice that, well, they had some milk, they were really hungry, they were try again. This milk had been sitting around and had soured. And by souring, the lactose is converted to lactic acid. Mm. And then you can eat it if you're lactose intolerant. So what I love is that someone is brave and crazy enough. This is the milk, I don't know, it's sitting in a dish for some reason. Maybe they were going to feed it to babies. Because they wouldn't, the adults wouldn't have eaten it. Yeah. Why, why would you do that? It makes it... So it's sitting around, it's gone clumpy and sour, you know, and they drink it, they try it, and they're like, I didn't get sick. And I think they went back and convinced all their relatives and friends, look, 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 I didn't get sick, look. And after a while, it'll be like, oh, fine, okay, well, oh. So then they would have to figure out what happened to the milk. And people from the past aren't just more stupid versions of us, they're just scientists, they were scientists too. Yeah. And they, so I have a rather grim theory about how the first cheese came about, which my editor wouldn't let me put in the book because um, it's a bit grim. So it involves dead goats. Right. And if you think that dead goats is going to put you off cheese, I won't tell you, but... It, Nothing you know, put me off cheese. I think so too. So I'll just say... because my So my original cheese origin myth is that someone had a bowl of milk, it soured, they drank it, and they worked, didn't get sick. But I'm sceptical about why are they keeping this bowl of milk? What's it doing mm. sitting around? What do they do with it? If you open a baby goat's stomach once it's dead, obviously you'd wait till it died, otherwise mm. that'd be horrible, um, yeah. you will find cheese in it. Because the way right. that ruminant animals right. um, get nourishment from milk is by making cheese in their stomach. The bacteria in the stomach and the acid sours and mm -hmm. thickens the milk, and they have natural rennet in their stomach, yes. which coagulates it. So inside that stomach, you find cheese. Now, peasants are hungry. They eat, the, mm. they see this stuff, they're going to eat it. Maybe yeah. they made a sausage by rolling up the yeah. intestine or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And they didn't get sick. So it had, it had the bacteria and the rennet all in there. Mm. This is similar to the story. There is an origin story that's quite famous uh, for, well, no, famous, widespread. There's even a little film of it, of, of the origin of cheese. Yeah. But I believe that it's, I'm afraid, nonsense. So this in this story, there's a nomad and he's got a bag of milk on, yes. under his saddle and it's made of the stomach of an animal. And he's riding along the desert on his camel or horse or whatever, you know, and uh, gets off at the end of the day and he's going to drink his milk and it's turned into cheese and it's really nice. And so, wow, he discovered cheese. The nomad would have been lactose intolerant and there's no reason for him to carry a, a milk. So humans invented cheese before they were able to mm. drink milk. I also think... It's fantastic for a culture if you can harvest food in the summer and then preserve it and keep it to the winter. So all of the sausage and pickles and cheese is just a survival strategy. Yeah, yeah, and the totally. tribes who did it outperformed the tribes who didn't. And you look at cheese making, it spreads beautifully. As, as, as 
people moved out of the fer- Fertile Crescent and one, in one direction they moved was north yeah. up into what was then, well, was to become Europe. They brought cheese making with them. So then the text starts appearing in archaeological digs as they head up through, mm. um, through Europe. So this U- profoundly European cultural practice of cheese making comes from the Middle East, which is fantastic. And I love it. I just, I love that. Also, it seems as if lactose tolerance, so, so humans developed the ability to drink milk in adulthood. It was called, well, it's called adult lactase persistence, if you really want to get into it. But lactose tolerance spread with cheese making. It right. spreads out, as you see the, the evidence of cheese making, in the bone record, you see humans mm. developing the, the enzyme to process milk. So it's as if a gene piggybacks on a human culture. Which is mad. I mean, it's probably far less romantic. I'm not a geneticist, you know. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but it's, no, just, it's, it's pretty cool. It's brilliant story. And so being able to digest milk is another excellent adaptive trait for human cultures mm. because you get more nourishment. So then the cultures that could, could digest milk outperform the other cultures. Yeah. So in a sense, from 7000 BC, there's been cheese imperialism. <laughs> this is a cheese imperialism of cheese making cultures spread out and taken over. Uh, taken over, which yes, is yes. Cool. <laughs> Eat your cheese if you want to conquer the world. To conquer the world, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I, I was just going to suggest that we try the next cheese. Yeah. Because yeah. This, so this is beautiful mold ripened goat's cheese.Eat. Yeah, and I was told, yeah, we should do this. Eat this. Fresh. It's, yeah. it's very fresh, yeah. Excellent. So, so yeah, I'll leave it to you too. So it's grown this beautiful rind on it. And in a sense for me, this is what happened when cheese making came to Northern Europe. Mm. Even perhaps to Rome. And to the, uh, you know, the Roman area. Because in the Middle East, it's too hot to leave cheeses around long enough to grow this rind. They yeah. would sour, go crazy, they wouldn't taste good. So you either eat them fresh or you preserve them in brine like your feta, which is an ancient, ancient form of cheese. I'm absolutely convinced that um, the, even before Greece, um, the peoples of the Mediterranean basin were trading in feta. Right. It was a big, right. it was a major trade. Um, so once it gets into the north in a cooler climate, you can grow a rind on it, a mold rind. So what I think happened is the peasant woman who was making her cheese, because it was all women, yeah. and they made these kind of small soft cheeses just like we're eating. She keeps them in her cellar or in a barn, okay. and some of them stay there enough to develop a rind mm. she's a peasant peasants are hungry so she eats the cheese goes gee that's nice in, in whatever language yeah. she spoke um, and I think then mould ripened cheese is born I'm sure it's an accident like cheese making and it's like the next it's the progression in mm. a sense from when they move out of um, that area of the Fertile Crescent and in, into Europe and I would argue that England Britain was a great place to make these sorts of Cheese is nice and moist and cool, you know. Yeah. Uh, so when did um, cheese making spread to Britain? Is it simultaneously with the rest of Europe, more or less? No, there's a lovely... So 4000 BC is the first is where you locate the first evidence for, for dairying and I think by extension cheese making in Britain. Mm. All right, and again, go. it's shards of pottery with traces of milk fat. It was something that... British, uh, well, archaeologists only discovered in, I think, 2013 yeah. how to tell what kind of fat it was. Before then, you just knew it was, uh, was fat. Being able to distinguish dairy fat from animal fat means you can then say this is direct evidence for dairying. In 4000 BC, people are still lactose intolerant, so it has to be cheese, yogurt, fresh cheese. It has to be some Something, processing. Yeah. yeah. So 4000 BC. There's... There's no, you, you can see these waves of farming culture coming up through Europe and then they stop at the channel and then after right. a while they come over. Okay. So one theory that I love is a wonderful archaeologist called Francis Pryor um, and he said, the land of Britain is so bountiful that the hunter-gatherers didn't need to develop the farming techniques yeah. that people over the, you know, 20 miles over the water were, were doing because they didn't need to. And, and um, hunter-gatherers have a lovely life. Farmers have to work much harder. Mm. They become shorter. They become less healthy. They 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 well, die younger. Yeah, they're yeah, malnourished. Yeah. And it's horrible farming. Yeah. So yeah, I just imagine these Britons lying Gun around. Disease, yeah, you're, nuts, everything. you're killing a boar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, but fine, I reckon it was beer and maybe cheese. So they go I over remember. to see their French cousins, 
and they've got this beer and this nice fermenting. Mm, yeah. You know, you kind of got to settle to start making beer and, you know, grow, grow, yeah. grow grain. Exactly. And it's just cheese is good. You know, more of a set. So then maybe it was that. Maybe it's beer and cheese that made us start. Yeah. There's evidence. The first evidence seems to centre a lot around Stonehenge. So the builders of Stonehenge were fueled by cheese, which is lovely. In Ireland, there's an amazing field system in Ireland called the Cade Fails field system. I probably pronounced it poorly. It's from, I think, 3,500 BC, and it's colossal. It was the largest field system in existence at the time, I believe. Right. And from some evidence of age of the bones, it was dairy farming. So yeah. that looks as if they were, the Irish were doing large-scale proto-industrial dairy farming 5,500 years ago, which is so cool. Extraordinary. So that's, I think, how, you know, as far as I see from what I've seen of the evidence, what I read in my interpretation, it's that. Mm. For a long time, we thought the Romans introduced cheese making to Britain. And, and the Romans were really scathing about the British and said they don't even make cheese. The, the Irish eat their families, you know, and, really, you know, and they don't make cheese. They don't want uh, to but I think ones. we did. Yeah. And I think that they brought new techniques, but that we were already mm. doing something. So in a sense, yeah, mm. I suppose, yeah, the very first cheese we tried was the fresh cheese with mm. Neolithic yep. people in the Fertile yep. Crescent. And we have something pretty fresh again, but with, with a the bit mold of, rind. With a bit more age, yeah. Something that probably appeared in North Europe. Maybe. Yeah. I think so. More. I mean, mountain cheese making as a whole culture, mm. that for me, it predates countries. You know, the people yeah. of the Alps didn't, they weren't French or Swiss or Italian then. Mm, yeah, or not. But they made cheeses that were the product of the kind of cheese making you had to do. You're making, mm. them, you're making them high up in a mountain pasture because the pastures in the Alps go up and yeah. you have to follow the snow melt. You have to. Exactly. And normally you'd use a lot of cheese in cheese making, a lot of salt, sorry, but. You don't want to carry bags of salt at the mountain. So they made cheese at higher temperature to not have to use so much salt to suck out moisture. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And they got particular flavours and bacteria uh, and textures to the cheese. And if you think of Fontina or Gruyere or um, Conte, they have similar textures and flavours because they're all that culture. You know, they had the same pressures on them. Yeah. And then I think it's Pliny. One of the Roman writers talks about cheese in... The markets of Rome from the Gaul Alps. Yes. Uh, what Vatusican, I think it might be called. And it sounds like a Beaufort to me. Right. They're yeah. big wheels. Also, they would have to be big and hard because you're not going to take tiny goat's cheeses on a cart from an Alp to Rome. You, you no. know, it's not going to work and it's pointless and they would, mm. they, would, they would be ruined. So they'd be big, hard cheeses. So I think arguably it has to be, yeah. some of the Alpine cheeses are really ancient. Yeah, well. yeah. And I remember I was trying to find about Roquefort, more mm. about Roquefort, and there was a story about Pliny or something. Yeah. He was mentioning some cheese of the Gauls. Yeah. But I think I think that might be a, bit, a little bit of a myth of, the, of think... the people who make Roquefort trying to... <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't want to, um, you know, mess with them, but everyone has their origin stories. Yeah. Everyone takes the so everyone takes the story of Charlemagne getting some cheese off the monk and digging out the mold and everything as as it's brie, it's rock for it's you know. Uh the what the cheese he describes, I think he talks about it being served fresh or something. And, yes. and people and yes. that rock for is months old. You wouldn't serve it fresh, you want it to bloom. No, exactly, no. It wouldn't be it wouldn't be the same thing at all. No. no. Um so I wonder, I mean, my other problem is, is you know, when you start asking, was this cheese made then or was it like this then? Or, is we don't know what the cheeses were like, even if they had the same name. Mm. Like if I could go back, you know, if I could build a time machine, I'd go back and eat ancient cheeses. I would so do that. I think that's... That'd be amazing. <laughs> that's the only reason to build a time machine, really. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. 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 So any, any other f- funny myths about cheese? Well... Here's the thing, it's, it's sort of a myth, it's, it's in the world of myth, and it also allows us to try another cheese. Yes. So, Brilliant. did you know that Cyclops, or Polyphemus, Polyphemus yeah. was, a, was a cheese maker? Yeah, you I do know that, but obviously... Yeah, most of well, you're Greek, you know, yeah. most people don't, no. And when you read uh, the section in Homer, it's almost a recipe for cheese making, because he talks about coagulating the milk 
with fig sap, I think, which is a yes, traditional thing. very traditional, very brilliant. And really ancient thing yeah. to do. He talks, well, Homer talks about pressing the curd in baskets, like kind of wicker cheese moulds, mm. and about having the cheeses on racks, nice and spread apart, so they dry, just like Pliny tells us, you know. It's so amazing. It's, I mean, you read it. I'd never realised this before I came across this passage in a cheese book. Um, and, and basically, it looks and sounds to me, it's sheep's milk, like a kind of pecorino sardo. This is based on manchego, what we're about to eat, I'd say, but these hard mm -hmm. sheep's milk cheeses, of which there must be many in Greece as well, yeah. are truly ancient. And so at first, when I started researching the book, I imagined a kind of 19th century style progression of, of sophistication, you know, from the first most primitive cheese, then it grows mould, then you learn how to make hard cheese through technology, and then you make the wash line and so on, as if there's this progression mm -hmm. in human endeavour from the simple to the complicated. And this has been around, when, when is um, the Iliad, is 3000 BC uh, it's, that it's written down? No, it's about 3000 years ago from, from today. From today, yeah, yeah, yeah. when it was written. Yeah, written, yeah. But wasn't it also handed on before then, orally? So yeah. the belief is that it's at the stories are much older. Much older. Yeah. So people have been oh, well, people have been making this for thousands of yeah of years. Um, I've got to say a thing about this. It's a lovely batch. What you want to do is crack it. Yeah. And then smell at the cracked face. What is? It's the smell of a tropical fruit. <laughs> what is that tropical fruit? Oh wow! Okay. Do you get Do you get the fruitiness? I, I get mean, the fruitiness. It's a bit yes. dried out because I bought it yesterday. I'm afraid. <sighs> I'm going to eat some. Mm. It's not pineapple. Yeah. Well, that's what I get. I get pineapple. And when you... It's very common for people to register pineapple from this cheese. It's right. called Berkswell, by the way. Yes. It's made in the Midlands. It's made um, on a farm not far from Coventry. Yeah. My friend lives near there. Really? Yeah. So have you had this before? Mm. So I think that this is ancient. I also think that... Well, I'm certain... That Rome, the Romans brought a hard sheep's cheese to England, to Britain. So they had, the army, in its ration, had one ounce of cheese a day for each man. It was hard sheep's milk cheese. Mm. That's 5,000 men in a full-strength legion, so that's 5,000 ounces of cheese a day that you have to have, you have to make. I mean, you can only make it from the spring to summer, so you've got to make... So um, you, it has to be something that's preserved. It has to be yeah. preserved, it has to be hard, so that it can fit in there. Yeah. You know, you can cut it for the rations. Um, and you need to make a lot. So you want to make standardised cheese, and, yeah. you know, in size and method. And you find in the archaeological record, all over Britain, Roman cheese moulds of a standardised size and shape. I love this. There's one in the British like, Army, a British Museum that's perfectly preserved. And there are, I've seen them in little town museums, literally mm. all over the British Isles. Same size and shape. So, and they they are often associated with Roman army sites. Yeah. So they made cheese. <clears throat> also, they didn't ship ten thousand Roman army cheesemakers over from Liguria or wherever to make the cheese. I think they brought a few people over and they taught the local people how to do it in the big Roman industrial dairies. Yeah. So they brought a kind of proto-industrial cheese making to Britain. I I believe. Um, it may be a crack. Well, I think, I think the evidence supports it. And I think that some of that method would be left when mm. the Romans left or faded away or, you know, the cultures melded together. Yeah. I'm sure that some of the methods stayed with them. And that, So if you look at... There's this bit when the Romans go, and we used to call it the Dark Ages. Yeah. And I called it the Dark Ages because there's no, no one wrote anything down for ages. And it's really hard to find anything about cheese making. From about 500 AD, sorry, 500 CE, till about, well, 16th century when it really starts to get written down. But it's a bit annoying. There's, there's little glimpses in the fog, which are amazing. So there's a, there's a lovely Welsh king called Hywel the Good. And he was good because he had these very fair laws. And um, one, his, a lot of his fair laws were about women's rights and women's right. rights in the divorce. And they were entitled, and they, I think, could divorce their men. They didn't have to wait around. They could initiate it. <laughs> and they got, apart from other stuff, all the cheese still in the brine bath. So this is in the dairy. In the brine bath, And it's yeah. in the brine bath. So one thing we know is they were brining their cheese in Wales. Uh, <laughs> when's that? 2,000 years ago. So my mate Todd, who makes the cheese, that uh, makes the reason I'm a cheesemonger, brines his cheeses in a brine bath. 
you know, he's in Western Superman now, but when he was in Wales, so that's mm. been that's a two thousand years of continuity. But um, he also says that when when his retinue arrive at someone's you know stately home, yeah, they're going to provide him with certain things: these tubs of honey, some ale, and it's a list, and it says and ten cheeses. That that means this cheese must be a standard size because he just says ten cheeses. Yeah. So he knows how much he's getting. So I, that standardisation, I reckon, came from the Romans. We're still mm. doing it, you know. Mm. Yeah, and this was 900 <laughs> CE or something. Yeah, yeah. Premium. Fascinating. Mm. So, do you want to try that feta cheese? I maybe? really do. I really do so much. Let's... I'm just going to spear this whole big yeah. bit, if that's yeah. okay. Is it sheep and goat? Sheep, sheep and goat, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's fantastic, isn't it? Speaking with my mouthfuls, I'm so excited. Mm. It's got that real animal taste. Yeah. I love it. Different taste. Yeah. But not too goaty. And I think this is partly the softening of the sheep Mm. in the flavour. It's just great. It's really tangy. Very tangy. And I think it tastes like the feather cheese I used to eat as a child. Yeah. And I can't find it for the love of money nowadays. I must be so sad. So does this bring you back, you know, when you eat it? Are you back there in Greece? I am, yeah, my family's table, mm. having a slab of feta with everything, basically. Mm. <laughs> Every lunch. Do you think that the feta of different regions would taste different? Or, I mean, is it a slightly different method from, say, Cyprus feta to Greek mainland feta? Or, I think so. Or think soil so. or something? So, because you, you can only make feta in certain places. So, it's obviously North Greece. Yeah. The, the prefectures of North Greece, Macedonia, Epirus, mm. Thessalia, Stereia Elada, Peloponnese down south, mm. in Crete, in Lesbos, the island of Lesbos. And I think I think that's a place you can name your, your cheese feta. Right. With a certain way. Um, other place makers were exactly the same cheese, but they cannot call feta. Yeah. But yeah, it does taste uh, different uh, because it's from different islands, yeah. different climates, yeah. and different soils, and yeah. so on. They have one in Peloponnese called Svela, which is it's called Feta of the Fire. <laughs> I love the name. Yeah, uh, it's 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 more intense. Basically, it's a lot more intense. Uh, similar to Feta, it has a different method of making, but yeah, it's it looks similar. And again, again. You eat it on the table, or you can yeah. fry it, and so on. But yeah, it does does have an intensity that you don't have with feta. How uh, interesting! And then you have one in a small island in the northeast of the Aegean Sea, near the near Turkey. So the island they do it in little wicker baskets, mm. exactly the same feta style, this, but in wicker baskets. This sounds like um, the Iliad, the world, the, yeah. the Homer story. Yeah, amazing. And. I had I had one in October, so my my father came and he brought me some, and it was so delicious. It, it was harder than feta. Yeah, but it had that tanginess and saltiness, and it just transported back to you know two thousand years ago or something. I thought yeah. that's how cheese was made. Absolutely, <laughs> and that was brilliant. And then there is yeah the places that they do cheese with all sorts of different ways. Like there's one that they sprayed a bit of um, sea water. Really? Uh, yeah. What, on the cheese as it's maturing? Oh, as maturing, it? yeah. yeah. Does it turn out like a washed rind, like these pinky ones that we've got, or does it just stay more like white? Uh, I think it has a rind. Oh, yeah. It has a little rind, yeah. It's very interesting. Cheese making, I think, you, you find the common things with every culture, yeah. and you see you know, how we're all <laughs> the we're same. We're all related the same, yeah. yeah. I love when I visit. Um, I visited some French cheesemakers a few years ago. My French is about thirty years old, and also they're speaking. You know, I'm going up and up and speaking to this guy Dede. He's this tiny little shack. that's probably medieval, you know, and his French must be some crazy dialect. But I know what he's talking about because I know that he's he's you know he's got his hands in a vat now. So he's just saying like Charlie's going. Right, I've got my hands in the vat, and I'm going to break the curd up to this size now. And then okay, now we're going to ladle the you know. So it's kind of a way to improve a new, another language, except that I would only know how to talk about making artisan French goat's cheese. But I wouldn't have any other vocabulary. I think there's a... <laughs> That's not a problem, is it? It's enough on the subject, yeah. <laughs> so I want to try the oil. I started cutting more cheese, ah. but I want to try this oil. 
So this one is from Peloponnese, and this is an Italian guy making olive oil in Greece. Oh, great. And it's organic, and mm. he won a gold award for this olive oil. And I think this year is exceptional. Yeah. This year, it's the, the best he ever made it. So yeah, just put a little bit on the spoon and uh, you know, serve it in your mouth like yeah. you do with with uh, wine. <laughs> yeah. And um, oh yeah, oh the taste of greenery. It's just fantastic, isn't it? And, it's and quite peppery. Peppery, raw so yeah. peppery. It's, it's actually hot, like a spice. Ooh, can I have some more? Yeah, <laughs> I want to pour it over the cheese. Is that allowed? That's that's more than allowed. Good. It's lovely to have. So the cheese is from the Peloponnese, and so is the oil. Yeah. This is like yeah. drinking wine and cheese in the same area, isn't yeah, it? The, yeah. What grows together goes together. Yeah, mm. Some more again. <laughs> you have to give me more oil then, because I just ate my. Own. I couldn't stop. <laughs> and some more again from. Uh... Thank you. North of Greece. Is it? Yeah. God, do you get your family to send you over like aid packages or something? Sometimes. Smell it. I don't think... Oh, wow. It's a different smell. It's more woody than um, yeah. our cheap English rosemary. Mm, sorry, I'm, ah. I want a bit more on my, with my rosemary and oil. I'm I think you liked it, didn't you? Pal- I really, really like it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I had um, I had a wonderful oil on Kortula, an island in off Croatia. Well, in Croatia, mm. and I went so mad about it that I think the guy who produced it thought I was a bit crazy. He'd never seen anyone go so mad about this stuff. James, what? I just make up my farm. You know? yeah, He's yeah, not yeah, even the kind of fancy producer. I just make this stuff. You know, like, oh my god, it's so incredible. Yeah, <laughs> I get that with olive oil. I get that. <laughs> You can't beat this freshness when you no. have fresh olive oil. Yeah. Just it has a different taste, completely different taste. Mm. This is a bit crazy. Do you get a tiny, tiny hint of banana? Okay. Just tiny. I'll have a bit on its own so I can see if I can taste the mm. banana. Mm. I mean, I've got it. I think we sold a Kalamata oil where I really noticed the banana. But, um, oh, right, okay. Uh, which, to me, almost, if I notice a flavour a lot, I almost feel that it has failed. In a cheese, I kind of want to be going, is that, is that, is it mm. rose? You know, and not really, I don't want to be going, oh my God, it's bubblegum. You know? <laughs> like, not necessarily. I mean, sometimes it's funny, the pineapple thing, when you open a whole burp swell and it goes, boof, it's funny. Yeah, I think that's a different... Proposition. Yeah. Yeah. Very fresh. You open it. Yeah, okay. You can smell it. But in this is subtle. Mm. It's very it is. subtle. It's just, that's just fantastic. Well. And I think I only went for pineapple because you said tropical fruit. Yeah. I try and lead the witness a little bit. Mm-hmm. I think I'm going to try that. So, but also, sometimes it's more pronounced and everyone says it. Mm-hmm. I, I'm, so I, people often ask me, how do you become a cheese monk? How do you train? You know, and I said, you eat lots of cheese, and they laugh, and then you're like, I know it's a good job, but um, <laughs> but you really do. And so every morning, you take all the cheese out of the cellar and out of the fridge, and you put it out on the counter, and you taste all of it mm. because it's ripening. You can't say to someone, here's this lovely mild brie, when suddenly it's just shifted a gear and it's become really strong. Yeah. So you're tasting all the cheese, and you're talking to your fellow cheesemonger about what you're tasting. Mm. So you're matching. This is what I believe is happening. There's a network of your brain that does tasting and a network that does labelling. Right. And then they are forging connections. So if you do this a lot, you get good at going, oh, I think I can taste butterscotch, some hay, you know. Yeah. It's not that I'm special or clever. Uh, it's not that I have amazing taste buds. I really don't. I've just done it a lot. And I think with sommeliers, if you're talking to other people, I'm doing the wine swishing mime, you know. Yeah. That's, that's how it, you get good at it. I think so. I love that because it means really anyone. I mean, unless God forbid you had lost your sense of smell, anyone can can do this. Yeah. And just what you need to do is eat lots of cheese with your mates, and talk about it. <laughs> this is the best job. I love it. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. Um, 
Yeah, so basically, yeah, we left the Neolithic kind of era, went to the Roman era, and we're we kind have, of a little bit post Roman now with sort of the Dark Ages the dark moving ages. out of that. It's yeah. a bit boring, not enough cheese writing. Yeah, <laughs> moved swiftly through that. There was one thing, another thing I picked up that was lovely in, in and this is more, my, my expertise now is much more in Britain than it would have been, yeah, you know, yeah. before when I was looking at early cheese making is that there's a, a, a record of the rents that the women cheesemongers of London have to pay to the local authority from maybe the, I think it's the 10th century. 10th century, okay. Yeah. yeah. That's, and they have that's to pay more at ago. Christmas. Sometimes they have to pay more at Christmas. So what it means to me is mm. you sell more cheese at Christmas back then, just like you do now. now yes. You know, when I, when I had my stall at Borough Market, the whole stall lived on Christmas and for the yeah, rest of the year, yeah. it was a howling desert of poverty. And then you just made all the money at Christmas. Um, so oh, stressful. Uh, but they, so do they. Mm. And so that also uh, suggests to me that some of the cheeses this lady was selling on her stall were fancy, were, were more co- quality. That you say so you bought your treats for Christmas, mm. the cheese. Yeah. Because I've always wondered, what kind of food is cheese? Is it a staple food for the peasant, like your thing that we have to try soon? Um, or is it a fancy food for the Lord? Mm. Or is it is it is it a ration for a soldier? Or is it, um, you know, a kind of fancy gourmet thing? And it's hard to tell, but and I think also both and all. I think... I think so, yeah. I think it's uh, a bit of everything. Yeah, and possibly yeah. when you look at... I mean, if there's recipes with cheese in an Apicius, then the Romans must have also considered cheese to be a treat and a fancy mm. food as much as a staple. But they called it white meats in Britain and they meant the crummy stuff that the peasants eat, you know. Mm. The thing, so the thing, as we move more into where there was more stuff written down and I kind of couldn't know a bit more, what I see is that the milk got the... Cre- the rich people got cream... The rich people got the fat. So if rich people got cheese, it was a full fat cheese. If you make cheese from... Well, you can skim the cream off and you can have it as cream or you can turn it into butter. Butter was always a high value product that you sold to rich people. Um, And then you can make cheese with the remaining milk. But usually it's going to be hard and uh, less Mm -hmm. flavoursome. And so you give it to the poor or the soldiers. You know, the workers and the posh people get the nice stuff. I know maybe it's a bit silly comparison, but what kind of cheese would be that nowadays? That the poor. Well, the I mean, that's such an interesting question because that kind of cheese wouldn't exist anymore because no one because food yeah. has got so cheap mm. now that no one needs to buy the crummy skim milk yeah, cheese. Yeah, yeah. So if I were to say parmesan. The people of Parmesan would kill me. <laughs> and, and, and it's it's one of the great cheeses of the world. Yeah. But it is made with skimmed milk. No way. Yeah. Okay. It's not full cream milk. As far as I know, I mean, God, I wouldn't want to malign it. Mm-hmm. But I think no, it's it a great is skimmed. Cheese. It's, it's amazing cheese. It doesn't cheese. matter. Yeah. 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 And I think also it shows some skill to maybe skim some cream off and, st- and make this yeah, absolutely yeah. amazing cheese. Yeah. So, but I think we have some descriptions and there's a lovely name... So in the Middle Ages, Suffolk rose to power. Well, East Anglia rose to power as the absolute governor of cheese making in Britain and just wiped everyone else out. They were a pinnacle. And this came as a considerable surprise to me because when I was a younger monger in the early noughties or whenever, I didn't think you could make cheese in Suffolk. I'd never heard of Suffolk cheese. Right. Which I apologise to the cheese makers of Suffolk now. I hadn't really heard of it. And I kind of assumed the land wasn't right and didn't know right. of any tradition of doing it. Yeah, yeah. So, but the thing was that it was great dairying land. Um, they had their own breed of cow, a Suffolk Dun. It was a brown cow, maybe like the red cows of Italy that mm. make great parmesan, maybe like the Swiss brown. So maybe maybe a lot of good cream in the milk. And they got a contract to supply the English army in the fight against the French in the Hundred Years' War. Okay. So, well, they got a contract to supply the garrison in Calais. And this was big money and they did really well. They went over to cow's milk because all, nearly all the cheese in Britain was sheep until around that time, which is something a lot of British people don't realise, that sheep's yeah. milk cheese is a traditional British cheese, and people are surprised. So, yeah, that, we're talking about um, the Hundred Year War. The Hundred Years War, 13-something or rather to 1453, 14th century, 14th, 15th century. 14th century. 
So, so one, up to then we had shaped sheep's milk. milk. Yeah, and one reason for that, I believe, I think, I think it was popular anyway. Uh, sheep dairying was done. Cows weren't really there for dairying; they were smaller. Mm. Is the, that sheep's milk? This is sheep's milk too. Yeah. So well, this is Lord this of the Hundreds, which is a suitably medieval name yes. for um, a cheese. The hundreds are, you know, kind of sm- like within a parish, you have hundreds. If I've got this right. Which are like small administrative areas. Ah, I see, I see. Okay, um, I was so it, very it, intrigued by the name. It, it, it alludes to that kind of feudal farming of, of the med- medieval time. I think, I assume that's what they mean. You can see it's sheep because it's pale. Yeah. God, I better have be sheep. I'd be dead. No, it is sheep, isn't it? Oh, no, it is, it is. Softer oh. than the birds as well. Less floral. More sheepy. Mm. It's excellent. I love the texture. Sheep smoke is, is quite high in fat. And so you get really creamy cheese. Um, harder to make. I think it's very easy to make rock hard sheep smoked cheese. It's amazing. Yeah. So, wait, wait. so yeah, so the Suffolk guys are making this cow's milk cheese, selling cheese to the army. And selling, they're close to London. And there's lots of great yeah. um, water transport to London. And London's where you needed to sell to if you wanted to make any money ever, you know, in Britain until the, I don't know, until the Industrial Revolution and the other towns started to spring up. You know? Yeah. So, so they, they did very well. But they had a problem in the cheesemongers of London, or the London cheesemongers, who were a sort of unofficial guild consortium of extremely powerful businessmen, had their own fleets of ships, their own networks of stores around the country. And they forced the Suffolk, the East Anglian cheesemongers, to skim the milk more and more and more, to get more and more butter, so the mm. London cheesemongers could make more and more money. And they would, for, they would say, for every pound of cheese, it's whatever, half a pound of butter. And they kept increasing. They said, now it's a pound for every pound of cheese. And they kept increasing the proportion to the point where the Suffolk cheese was skimmed so much that it was rock hard and tasteless. And it had a terrible reputation. It was called Suffolk Bang. And um, there's a poem about it, which went, those that made me were uncivil. I am harder than the devil. It says, fire (laughs) won't sweat me, a knife won't cut me. And people hated it. They gave it to the navy. So the navy in the in that period, you know, oh tough, tough men who ate salted beef that could be a hundred years old in these casks, and yeah. the navy refused to eat it. They wouldn't eat it. So this great power of cheese making in Britain <laughs> rose to this point, and then was broken partly by that. Also, there was some flooding in Suffolk, and there was cattle plague. Mm. But altogether, it just kind of destroyed the Suffolk cheesemakers. So the story of cheesemaking Britain is the story of kind of rise to power and tragedy, like an ancient tragedy. <laughs> yeah, you know, they, you know, they were brought low. And they tried <clears throat> to stop it. The Suffolk cheesemakers went to Parliament yeah. to say, look, these London cheesemakers are forcing us to do this thing that's putting our cheese into ill repute. This was by the 17th century, so it went on for a while. Right, yeah. Uh, and, and yeah, no, the cheesemaker, the cheesemongers were too powerful. Just, just, just broke them. That I should say, and I always like to say this in public. It's very important that my friend Jared has a shop called London Cheesemongers. It's in Kensington. It's an excellent cheese shop, and he's a very nice man. And he would never single-handedly destroy the cheese-making culture of an entire region of Britain. I promise you, it's not Jared. <laughs> he's not the same as them. Um, but we should, we should go back actually and talk about the monks a bit. Yes. Because it allows us to try a couple of other cheeses. I was going to ask about the monks because... Hugely important. Surely surely we, we have records as well from... Some, yeah. Some really interesting records. Um, I mean, one thing about research for me, I was trying... I was going to the British Library. I was trying to drill down as far as I could to some sort of bedrock of primary source. But I cannot read medieval British monastic Latin. And I would get these books... And it's always a 19th century book, and it's always by Colonel something. After he retired from the army, he's found an interest in, you know, medieval, monastic yeah. accounting books or something. Mm. And so the introduction's in English, and he says, yes, and you know, and there was the dairying and Sibton Manor and so on. And you think, brill, and you open the chapter to Sibton Manor, and I started making this sound, and this emotion would come over me, like, muh, because it's in Latin. So I was restricted. It must be very It was frustrating, yeah. Uh, but there are... I found one beautiful thing, and it's, he's, he's one of my favourite guys in the book, actually. And he was, a, he was a, I think, PhD student who wrote a study about monastic um, industry and agriculture. He's called R.A.L. Smith. 
and he was really into cheese. He was really <laughs> interested in cheese. So there's loads of stuff about cheese because they're huge business as wool. And grain was the big business that everyone mm. got into. It was the aristocratic thing. So people tended not to be interested, historians or the writers in cheese. Mm. But this guy just loved it. So, so I, I was in the rare books and manuscripts room of the British Library. It's quite a quiet place. And I opened this book and I yelled with joy. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, 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 sorry, sorry, sorry. and you know, and the thing I'm excited about is I found monastic cheese making treatise. The other thing I love is that he wrote it in the middle of World War II. I oh, think it was so 42. It's quite, it's quite old. Um, yeah. And it's such a random find, you know. So this is an obscure thing. It's yeah. a funny little uh, sort of track. But this guy, while World War II is raging around him, and I think it's 42 or so, so it's not looking good. You know, mm. you could easily think we're going to be invaded by the Nazis, you know. And he decides to write a treatise on medieval monastic cheese making. I just loved him. As What a great human. So he... <laughs> And the thing is, what you can tell from his study is that it was it was an, almost a sort of industrial system. It was big, mm. large scale. They really started nailing standardisation. So they talk about three sizes of cheese. Um, they talk about um, how much milk you can you can get out of mm. of um, a cow, and how much of that's going to turn into cheese. They knew this from these treaties on on, on estate management that were mm. written around the time. Part of this is to make sure your cheesemakers aren't ripping you off. So they, they would they would to see if you, you might be skimming off cream. Yeah. I'm pointing at you saying you're this criminal cheesemaker now. Uh, you might be skimming off cream or you might be stealing cheeses or something. Yeah, yeah. Because you needed this for your family. Uh, and they knew. So there's a bit in the records where they're talking about two manors and they're both owned by one uh, monastic house in Canterbury. They're, so these are like two farms and they've each got a guy running them. And one of them's making way more cheese than the other one. And mm. I always feel really sorry for this other guy because you know that he gets brought in by the abbot. You know, so John, <laughs> how come Joe down there is making more cheese? You stealing cheese? Because you should be making this much. So they, they, they knew. But the other thing that isn't written, because they don't really describe what kind of cheese, they don't describe what kind of cheese is. You kind of guess from the tech. Right. And, and, and the sizes and things. It's not because you you can't find the, they don't the, say, the text. They don't say things like, um, oh, the abbot presented me with a lovely Canterbury cheese today. Mm. It was hard and it tasted of flowers. Mm. And, you know, and, and they're not like us talking about these yeah. flavours. Um, I don't know if they even thought like that. I don't know. But um, you guess a bit from sizes and shapes. I think they're fairly hard cheeses because they're quite big. Yeah. Um, but I also think that they were making washed rind cheeses, which are, we tend to think of as French, Belgian, perhaps German. They are the soft, pink, sticky, very pungent cheeses that divide the world, mm, you know, mm. into, oh my God, that's what? amazing. And that's not a food stuff. Why have you done that to me? You know, <laughs> uh, which was my wife's position for a long time. Now she's coming around. But um, <laughs> so... And, <laughs> The thing about these cheeses, so one, so if they were made over on the continent, all these monastic houses were in communication with each other, and there's a constant flow yeah. of people. They're bringing texts to another monastery to be copied. They're, you know, visiting to check that everyone's adhering to the monastic yeah, rule. Yeah, yeah. And and I, you know, some guy goes over to France. He eats this cheese. He goes, "This is amazing." And the brother John, show me how you do this. And brother shows him, and he brings it back to his monastery in um, Jervaux in in Wensdale, and says, "Look, look, I've got this recipe. Make this banging." You know, um, he didn't say banging because they wouldn't have said that back then. <laughs> but so 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 these cheeses are pungent, creamy. Um, Salty, they're quite luxuriant. I don't think the rank and file monks ate the stuff for this good. No, I think they I ate think the skimmed milk, hard, you know, peasant cheese. I think the abbot might the have abbot. Eat cheese like this. Yeah, mm. love it. Remind me which one is this? What, what? My mouth full of cheese, Tom. That's why I'm asking now. And I'm gonna have a glass of wine with it. This is this lovely Gewurz, Gewurz and gentle washed rind cheeses. Lovely, lovely match. Mm. The cheese is so savoury and salty and slightly barnyardy, and the wine is so sweet. And yeah. Like um, salted caramel with a kind of funky, rude edge. It's called Durris. This cheese is from Ireland. It's from County Cork. County Cork is the centre of. It's where one of the, the a part of one of the places where the 
great cheese renaissance kind of kicked off in the late 70s when we started we people started making artisanal style cheeses again so the thing about these wash rind cheeses what you do is you wash the young cheese in brine in salt water yeah so you take your thing that looks like a parash with no rind and you wash it in salt water it kills the mold spores that would grow on it and turn this into a form of brie or camembert and it encourages a bacterial rind to grow on the cheese because mm. this bacteria loves wet and salt, wet mm. and salty conditions. It's a bacteria that's around it, it's on our skin. So I think the first wash rinds happened by accident. I think there's a monastic cheese maker, or perhaps Affina, a person who's looking after the cheese. He maybe doesn't Sweaty know hands. he's doing that. Sweaty yet. hands. Sweaty hands. They didn't wash much back then. Bless them. Um, He's maybe not making the cheese, he's storing it for his boss. He's not a full affineur yet, he just keeps it and tries to not let it go bad. Yeah. Some of the cheeses go pink. He's a monk, he's hungry, he's got a boring diet, he tries it. It smells a bit funny, but he tries it anyway. And it's amazing! And he thinks, how do you do that? So they figured out, you know, experimented and figured out it's brine. And it's just... Must have taken, could have taken a hundred years or something. Uh, yeah. But humans are smart and, you know... Um, but salt water, cork, is right on the west of the Atlantic coast. Veronica Steele was trying to make hard cheeses, and all her cheeses turned into washed rinds because <laughs> the salty wet air. And she said this lovely thing, and eventually she gave in and started making a cheese called Milines, which is super funky, much more intense than that. And she said, you have to make the cheese the land wants you to make, which is like one of the most beautiful things anyone's ever said about a cheese. Yeah. This is just glorious. That's definitely... And it's and I, every cheesemaker would would understand that, you know, in whatever culture or language. So this Durris, it really comes from the land, from the, you know, from the wet salty place. And you, mm. I, this earthy flavour, maybe. And I think this is a monastic style. And I think that we probably did make these cheeses, not yeah. in the monasteries themselves, because. You don't have cows and that inside the monasteries. You have them on a farm. Yeah. The monks weren't really supposed to... They weren't supposed to leave the monastery at all. Yeah. So yeah. the so idea of the farmers... Mon- yeah, yeah, yeah. Farmers make... And they, they had cheesemakers making cheese. I'm sure of this. The monks didn't have their arms in vats and no. making cheese because they weren't doing that. But then the cheese was brought in. I think what the monks did do, though, is become affineurs. Oh, yeah. Because they were looking after the they food. Were, yeah, yeah. Um, so I think we can thank the monks for affinage in a way, maybe... Peasant women are too busy to mess around washing yeah. cheeses. Yeah, yeah. Like, and they lost so much. And, you know, there's another thing we can thank Henry VIII for is maybe there were more monastic texts on cheese making. Maybe there, maybe, mm. maybe there was some monk who wrote a letter to his brother monk saying, listen, I just had this amazing cheese and it tasted yeah. like flowers. And, you know, maybe <laughs> yeah, it's there. Yeah. Maybe, you know how so many of those ancient manuscripts got used to bind books and things. Maybe yeah. one day... We'll open an old book and find a monastic treatise. That would be nice. I'd be really pleased if that happened. Should we try the other uh, mm, more screen, which yeah. is the Isle of Avalon, which uh, I'm, I'm, yeah, you know more than, than me about it. <laughs> I'm not sure. So is it by the same people who make um, Lord of the Hundreds? I can't remember. I think... I think it might be. I mean, for one thing, it's got kind of romantic British name. Yeah. You, know what, you know what the Isle of Avalon was? Is that something to do with um, King Arthur? Very good. Yeah. It's where it's where he, you know, when he fell into his long sleep, he's taken off in a boat to the Isle of Avalon, and he'll come back. Yes. You know, when everything goes wrong, so he should be back quite soon, right? Yeah. Well, <laughs> um. Anyway, similar um, story with uh, there's a Greek king, emperor mm, of Constantinople, mm, that he was made of a, made a statue when uh, when the Ottomans invaded. Yeah. And they took the city. <laughs> yeah. And he will come. And back. he'll wake up. I yeah, didn't yeah. know that. Yeah. Isn't it fascinating, and we can speak about this because it speaks to shared cheese culture, Yeah. that you can have the same story that you've got your king, yeah, he's in a statue, but we all have our kings under the mountains and mm. buried in the statues. <laughs> and, you know, we all have the blue cheese myth, I love this. You know the blue cheese origin story? Uh, yeah, a little bit, but... So there's a on. peasant. I think we have to tell and, um, he's uh, And he's looking after his sheep. And he has this lunch of some bread and some fresh cheese, like the feta or like the the, per, the parage. And then, and then, to, and then the story diverges. So for most cultures, the story is that he sees some bandits appear. So he runs away and he hides his cheese and bread under the rock. 
Unless you're Italian, in which case it's that he goes away to see his girlfriend. <laughs> which I love. So the Italians are perfect. They just fit their stereotypes I love so it. beautifully. I, love it. I know. I love that. So anyway, he goes off to his girlfriend and runs away from the bandits or whatever it is that he does. And he comes back a while later and remembers where his food is because he's yes, a peasant and he's I hungry. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. And then the mould from the bread has got onto the cheese and the cheese has gone blue, but he's a starving peasant, so he eats it anyway. Yeah. And, as I keep saying, thinks, that's amazing, how do I make that? <laughs> now, the reason I think it's not true, not perfectly true, not literally true, is because every cheese-making culture I know has the story. And yeah. if you feel like if everyone's got it, it can't be like totally true. But given it's the same mould... You know, that's on bread. Yeah. And given that cheesemakers used to make bread, let it go mouldy and use that mould to make the blue, I think they may still do in Rockford. Oh, maybe. It's possible. Yeah. Um, there must be a bit of truth in it. And again, you see this, you have the image of the pe- hungry peasant seeing the cheese is blue. They're going to eat it anyway. Yeah. And then they develop it. <laughs> but I love the way, yeah, and the, the Italian sort of cultural stereotypes, just gorgeous. I haven't heard that story in Britain about Stilton, though. <laughs> Which is funny. Maybe we need more powerful cheese origin myths. Um, so it's great because we've got, you know, I've, I've got plenty of job left, which is going around telling people how amazing British yeah. and Irish cheese is. Yeah. And also that we have this tradition for thousands of years. And that yes. we, in the, 18th, well, in the 17th century, there was a boom in Cheshire making. It became the cheese. It took over after the Suffolk cheesemakers were wiped out yeah london cheese mongers looking for a new cheese found the cheshire started selling in incredible amounts and it, yeah. it, it exporting hundreds or thousands of tons to france and um, such big business it all went out of the port of chester and in france they have a cheese called chester which french people sometimes think is a british cheese it's never existed we've never called it chester and it's a vestige of that historical thing that they used to get their cheese from Chester. The other thing that happened then was there was the trade was going down from Chester to London uh, and then back up with, with goods, you know, they would sell the cheese, buy yeah. goods, bring it up. It changed the economy of, of the North West and because it just brought all this money, it brought mm. these goods in. But it also created a new class of criminal that I just love, which is French cheese pirates. French cheese Yeah, when we went to war with the French. They had to be French. I'm fr- well, they, the reason they were French cheese pirates, I'm sure there's been British, actually I know there's been a British cheese pirate, but that was back in the medieval period and he was pirating French ships and stealing their cheese. We need to hear about the story, but tell me but, about yeah. the well, French. Um, French cheese pirates, um, uh, because we went to war with the French, which is basically the national pastime for yes. the British, was going yeah, to yeah. war with the French until about 1914 or something when we found someone else to go to war with. But... Um, so, so it was sixteen seventies, I think, um, and and so they were like privateers. You know, this is the other funny thing because they're French, they're privates. The British ones are called privateers because they get some letters from the king saying, "Yeah, you can go and nick French stuff." Yeah, and then they go out and nick it, but they're privateers. So they were probably are pirates. yeah pirates. <laughs> they were probably English cheese pirateers too. Yeah, but I, I just I love that. I found out so much wonderful stuff while I was doing the research, but, and and mostly that we do make wonderful cheese we always did there's a lovely bit of writing that uh, a friend another cheesemonger found for me and it's a bit of it's an italian writer medieval writer and he wrote a treatise on milk and dairy products mm. a lovely man and he talks about the wonderful cheeses of england that you buy in these markets in in i think in what's now belgium he says oh, right, they're delicious okay. really highly prized they're huge they're beautiful they have kind of stamps of flowers and decorations on them he says, if anything, a little bit hard, a bit indigestible. He says, maybe if they used less, less sheep's milk in the mix, they would make it softer, which is true, I think. Right, because yeah. if you need different amounts of rennet to make cow and sheep cheese. Mm. So if you mix the milks together, you could maybe end up with a cheese that got really hard, mm. I, I think. Um, so, and it's really prized. And I just want to go around with that and show everyone, you know, look, yeah, look. The, you know, the foreigners don't hate us. They, they loved our cheese. They thought our cheese was great. Um... <laughs> Yeah, cheese is magic. Should we give it a go to... Yes, please. What is this thing? <laughs> well, it didn't come out exactly how I meant it to. This looks lovely, Tom. What is it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, for one, for a few of my catering events for ancient food, mm. um, I make a sort of 
fancy version of a peasant's lunch in a sense. So you had onions, cheese, um, olives, yeah, um, some nuts, which was the the peasant's lunch or the farmer's lunch, and um, yeah, these ingredients in a in a kind of fancy cheese log, yeah, uh, modern sort of thing. So it has feta cheese and a bit of um, pecorino romano uh, mixed with um, fresh uh, spring onions, uh, olives, um, grilled artichokes yeah. or marinated artichokes, all chopped finely, and then the crust is smoked almonds, which I usually smoke them myself wow, in my smoker, really? but not <laughs> during the week, <laughs> the winter. I just bought them from the shop. <laughs> Brilliant! I've never heard of anything like that. So let's. Um, Let's have some fancy peasant's lunch. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Thanks, Tom. So this is... We do have the best job in the world, don't we, really? <laughs> but sometimes I wake up and laugh. I used to wake up and oh, God. You know, when I was at work as an office boy or something. Yeah. And I used to wake up and chuckle when I think about what I'm going to be doing. Oh, yeah, it's, it's magical. Mm. <laughs> mm. It's really delicious. It's like it's kind of like a really posh borsam with bits. Mm. I know that doesn't. Yeah, that, I'm not. I'm gonna work on my compliments, Tom. I love the. Really, <laughs> I love the really open texture. Totally normal. And totally fine. There was actually. Um, I tried. Um, dead goat cheese in the cheese festival in Bra in Italy near mm, Turin okay. and they actually had they get a goat they, a dead goat they open it up and they put milk in and then they bury it for a while and that's how you make the cheese and I still Incredible. say that's the best thing I've ever seen I've got to have some of that I mean only a cheesemonger would think that's the best thing yeah, I've ever seen yeah. so I enjoyed it and I was fully ready for it to be really difficult you know sort of animal and yeah. you know, it was just like feta I was a bit disappointed. I like, think if you're brave enough, and that's yeah, it's okay. just feta. I mean, good feta, but um, pretty funky. But not, you know, like you think if I'm brave enough to eat dead goat's cheese, it's, surely it should have a bit more here. You know, <sighs> but I, that, I mean, I hadn't then. That was years before I thought of writing this book. Yeah. So maybe the vestige of that image was in my head when I was thinking about how would you possibly discover cheese making. Mm, it, True, true, yeah. I think they make this in Greece still. I think they maybe just take the stomach though, it's not the whole goat. Yes. And they and then they would fill that with milk and mm, mm. but I think they do bury it. Maybe. Um, you would know. So I've been I've been investigating some Greek cheeses from all over the different areas. And there's so many islands. So everybody does a bit things differently. But so far I've seen it in islands. Mm. Gold stomach. Mm. Filled with milk, mature, mm. blah, blah. But so far, it's all hung and they're dried. I haven't seen something buried. Mm. But, yeah, maybe maybe that's happening. I have to find, actually, some people that they, they know a bit more about these things. Cause it's also possible, yeah. I'm a cheesemonger. I mean, I might have, no. <laughs> and also, just... <laughs> my, Italy, my, my Italian is almost non-existent, so it's entirely possible what they meant was we make the cheese, wrap it in goat stomachs, and then bury it mm. or something. You know, so it was made, matured, and then buried to store. Right, right. Or, I yeah. think people buried stuff to store it. Oh, yeah. Often in amphorae or something. Yeah, yeah. I often cry about cheese. I cried in um, in Bra when we went to see the Cravero maturing house. So all, as far as I know, all the maturing houses for Parmesan are owned by banks. Except right, for okay. one, which is the house of Cravero, the family. There may be more families. This is the one I met. Mm. But it's rare, anyway. And his family have been doing this for generations, for hundreds of years. Yeah. So the first son is always called, called Georgia. And when you go to his office, which is in the stone, almost a castle, there's all the paintings on the walls of the Georgios going back hundreds of years. It's like a vampire, but the cheese. <laughs> Um, he's a lovely man and then you go to the maturing room which is a cathedral of cheese I mean it's the size of a cathedral mm-hmm. and it's the shape and it's got t- t- hundred, tens of thousands of wow. wheels I don't know going up into you can barely see can we mere mortals go and visit his well I, I, I don't exactly. maybe he's very nice I mean you could ask nicely you must be able to it's not the only house mm. that matures I mean they would be crazy to not allow 
to yeah. most visitors to yeah. see it. When I saw this and looked up and saw 10,000 wheels of palms, I was just crying, you know. And George is going, what? Nah, it's just cheese. <laughs> but he knows. It was amazing. And also you're thinking again, they've been doing this for a thousand years, you know. The yeah. guys moving the Parmesans is 35 kilos. When I lift up a Parmesan, it's quite a business. You know, I prepare for it, Yeah. you know. And, <clears throat> and it feels like you're just at the edge of your capacity. And these guys are just flipping them and moving them around. It's not strength, though. It's this amazing technique, technique of moving yeah. stuff that, again, you imagine like their father did it, his father. And yeah, yeah. So I love the pastry. And is it from an actual recipe or is it inspired by? Oh, inspired by. Yeah. Inspired yeah. by. Yeah, yeah. It's just delicious. Yeah. Um. So I, I really love cheesemongers because they're really obsessive. Um, lots of recovering philosophers become cheesemongers. I'm too a recovering philosopher. That was my first, my first degree was in philosophy. Um, I think largely because you can't make any money out of doing yeah. philosophy, so yeah. you do other stuff. Exactly. But um, so in my book, I imagined a kind of Romano British guy, and he's quite posh, and he's he's got a villa, and he's in with the Romans, you know, and he's got some fancy foreign Roman cheese on his dinner yeah. table, you know, some, some Vatusican from Rome or something. And he's got some nice local fresh cheese. And it's rolled in Kentish cob nuts. Mm. And then my lovely friend Doug, hi Doug, um, wrote to me and he said, it's a good book, Ned. And I was like, yeah. You know, if cheesemongers say it's good, it's the best thing. He said, but listen, Ned, cob nuts didn't come to, to, to Britain until the medieval period. You know, you'll have to change that. <laughs> but I loved it. You know, that's what I want. You know, if I messed up very in that specific, way, that's okay. Yeah, yeah, very specific thing to, to tell you. To know and to, yeah, that's, and it's, it's, it's in the quality of, you find it in good cheesemongers because this is not a job you do if you want to get rich. Mm. It's not a job you do if you don't want to get up at four in the morning every day in the week up to Christmas. It's not a job you it's want to do yeah. if you want to, don't want to turn a hundred cheeses in a cellar, you know, but you need a real commitment and you need a sort of integrity. And it's the same with being a cheesemaker. I have a theory that you can't make great cheese unless you're a decent human being mm -hmm. because you need patience, you need to be gentle, you need to be calm. Um, not all the cheese makers are calm, but they're pretty calm. You need to have total <laughs> integrity. Yeah, yeah. I loved the Lord of the Al... What was it called again? Isle of Avalon. Yeah, yeah. We didn't Little comment on, yeah, yeah. Much more funky than the Dallas. Much more intense. I love that. Very funky. So this is... Um, I say this about every cheese I like. This is one of my favourite cheeses. I just say it's about every cheese. It's like cheese. It's so hard, yeah. You can't. This is French. And we're going kind of back in time again. Uh, it's called oh. Contal. Specifically, Contal au lait de salaire. So it's made from the milk of the salaire cow, mm. who are a breed local to the Auvergne, native to the Auvergne. And um, the milk has a character, has a flavour. Well, this is said. It's also, um, it's made, traditionally it's made in wooden vats, I think called jer, if my pronunciation is right, it's probably terrible. The wooden vats, which are often quite old, just contain the bacteria the in the wood, yeah. like, a, like a starter culture. Yeah. So they don't need to use starter culture, they Again, just put the milk. Ancient. There was a time, I say recently, that the, the, the French government or hygiene you know, um, uh, department wanted them to stop using these things and use steel because they're worried about the hygiene yeah. implication. And so they did a lovely um, experiment with, I think, souring milk in a gel, an old gel, and souring it in a, in a um, steel vat, and then introducing, I think, listeria, introducing a pathogen to the milk, and it went rampant in the steel vat and died in the wooden one. Because there's a huge population of bacteria all competing. I, yeah. I think and there must be. there's an argument that raw milk has enzymes that can protect it to some degree against some bacteria. Yeah. Um, I, I think I've read a paper on that. I would like to read more. But just that this natural way might just, you know, there's a reason that they were doing this. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. so yeah, they've exactly. been allowed to keep the Brilliant. share. That's, that's a good, the, the, um, good story. It really is. Mm. They make it, traditionally you made it in the Bjorn, the stone hut up in the mountains of the Auvergne and you go up in the spring and you're up there on your own or with your with a few mates you know looking after the cows making cheese you come down in the late autumn yeah and that's your life um, it's tough this is lovely this is also got a slight bit of heat the the, mm. the contel yeah a little bit of pepperiness interesting 
thinking about the pepperiness of the oil. Actually, very different from all the others. So dishes. different from yeah. all the others, yeah. It's, it's, I would say it's quite a friendly mild batch for this mm. cheese because you can get some Contal or the super authentic one is just called Salaire. Right. And I've given that to a room full of people and heard the sound of 20 people going, because <gasps> it's so intense. And sometimes they leave it easy. They're not really eating very much of it. My friends had cheeses where she said, you know, they range from the glorious to absolutely appalling. Yes. Thank you. Oh, this is so exciting. This is the Roman pesto yeah. type sauce. Right. Yeah. <laughs> this has just appeared on my plate. Um, Got to eat this thing first. Yeah, it's, it's so it, important. Yeah, yeah. So tell me again what's in this. Um, mm. Pecorino. Mm. Garlic. Lots of garlic. Some garlic. Yeah. Ooh. That's lots of garlic. Um, fresh coriander and a few celery leaves. It's, so so different from pesto that I almost thought it was mint but it's the celery and um, coriander yeah, it's got yeah. that more that it's not phenolic I can't there's a word there's a word in my head it's more like the dill end of the spectrum of herbs and the less mm, well, savoury yeah, yeah it's and it had almost mm. a bitterness and um, soapy mm. so, soapiness um, aromas you know it's really glorious so it's I left it for the end because it's so strong with all the garlic you don't want to... You're never going to taste anything again. Yeah, so that's the last thing you can eat. That's just the correct amount of garlic, by the way. <laughs> I love garlic, well, and I love that, but that you, you're going to be mm. tasting that for the next week, it's, I think. It's, so it's, it is essentially a pesto, isn't it? Isn't mm. it lovely to think that it's, there's this ancient forebear of, of pesto? Yeah. 2,000 years, and 2000 nothing, years. almost nothing yeah. changed. It's so magic. A bit of white wine vinegar, a bit of olive oil, yeah. cheese, lots of garlic, yeah. and herbs. Mm. Mm. Before you go, mm. I would like to ask you if, if there is any sort of home cheese that people can make themselves at home. You could. So I am not a cheese maker. I'm a cheesemonger. I've made a fair bit of cheese, but I'm no expert at making cheese. But you absolutely can make cheese at home without any special equipment. And I could say that here is a really simple cheese recipe now. It's a bit of a cheat. But get some milk. Um, heat it to a kind of blood temperature, I think, and add some yogurt, and then um, let it sit somewhere warm for a while, and then dra- and then drain it, and there Brilliant. would be a kind of soft, fresh cheese. Maybe don't eat it. <laughs> I don't know, it would be okay. When you make yogurt, you have to heat the milk to boil, almost boiling, or even boil it slightly. Right. Okay. And it, cha- it denatures the protein and changes the mm. texture, and and you can then drain that yogurt and it's kind of a form of soft cheese uh-huh. um, but it's kind of a different thing from you know you're not taking milk to that temperature when you make cheese but you could do this with a sieve a bit of cloth mm. a couple of pots some some milk if you want to get fancier you can buy cheese starter cultures online okay uh, and you could just be a prehistoric cheese maker and just buy some culture get some milk and start yeah. fooling around and you know you might kill yourself though because probably in the in the, <laughs> in the history of cheese making it's a very safe food. People don't tend to die from from cheese; they die from chicken. Chicken yeah. bad. Yeah. Um, but it's very, it's it's a way of making milk safer. But you know, if you just fooled around by yourself, you might you might make something a bit moody. So the other thing I would do is I would get one of two books. There's a book by a guy called Paul Thomas. Oh. I think it's it's called Home Cheese Making. It's the book about cheese making by Paul Thomas. Paul is a fantastic cheese maker and teacher, mm. and he comes from the microbiological end of this, and he is a measurer. And a you're going to be safe. You're going to oh, be. Oh, you'll be safe. Yeah. And you're gonna, you know, he's got a brain the size of a planet. His yogurt recipe, um, like my mum's yogurt recipe, is get yogurt, heat yogurt, heat, get milk, <laughs> heat it till it's the right temperature. By sticking your finger in, put some yogurt in, stir it, That's leave it in the warming cupboard, yeah, and then eat it. And his is pH times, you know, makes amazing yogurt. Mm. If if you don't want to go down that rigorous route, Morgan McGlynn, who owns um, a cheese shop in uh, Muswell Hill Cheeses, uh, yes. she's written a lovely book of home cheese making okay. and some cheese cooking as well. And that would be a that's a more don't Paul's not inaccessible it's just demanding yeah okay. um, Morgan's is a more for the sort of more dilettante gosh I sound like I'm slagging Morgan off it's a lovely book <laughs> for just having a go you know and making some interesting stuff 
those would do you, do you fine. I would use a book. You can buy yeah. mm. cheese making kits. Right, so there's, just there, is, there are ways yeah, to do there that. There are ways to do it if you want to do it. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the easiest thing I've done is buying a really nice yogurt and letting it strain on a, yeah. on a cloth. Bit of salt, yeah. and let it strain for a day yeah. or two, and just make like it's yogurty, but yeah, it's, it's kind of a fresh cheese. I mean, yeah. and you know, I don't think I'm not sure if there's a real, absolutely nailed down official legal um, mm. description of cheese because, as far as I can see, there's this vegan business that I don't really hold with, but um, they call it vegan cheese, so yes, they must they be did. able to, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I yeah. think if you got made some yogurt and strained it, it's fresh cheese. Yeah. I also think that it's a great idea to make some yogurt because you're on the same path mm. and you're starting to do this kind of thing, fool around with it a bit and, and you get a feel culture, for it. Yeah, yeah and the culture. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I would do that. Lovely. On that note, thank you very much for Thanks, coming. Tom. That was great. <laughs> and testing all Thanks this amazing. For the lovely food. Great. Cool.